So here we are at our third online lecture about count outcomes. Counts are non-negative integer values. So generally anything that we could characterize as the number of times uh, something happened, we would consider a count. Um, oftentimes we only have counts, like we might have the number of wars that a country has been through or a number of uh, cabinets that got formed uh, in a certain number of time or like we'll talk about later, the number of voluntary organizations that somebody joined. Um, we might also have a variable that measures the potential count, the number of times that something could have happened. Um, there's a different set of models than the ones we'll talk about today, uh, if we have those kinds of variables too. Uh, but today we're just going to consider the case where we only have the count and not some sense of the uh, potential. Under the right circumstances, we could apply the linear model to these kind of data and get basically the right result. Uh, under the wrong circumstances, however, that is having the wrong distributional assumptions, the linear model could be inefficient, inconsistent, and biased. Um, basically, the right circumstances would be when all of the counts are well away from zero. Uh, and it might be even in that case that you get the wrong answers but um, even in the cases where you could potentially use the linear model the count model is probably the right thing to do because we have non-negative integer values we don't necessarily want to know the predicted value we want to know the probability that y takes on the count that we observe uh, usually given some set of variables. So unlike in the linear model where we could predict any kind of value, here we could predict lots of different values, but they have to be non-negative integers. If we want to know something about the probability with which something happens, we need to have a probability distribution. And for count data, the simplest one uh, is called the Poisson distribution. The Poisson uh, probability mass function, remember we talked about probability density functions as being for continuous variables, and probability mass functions being for discrete variables. So this is what the probability mass function for the Poisson distribution looks like. And you can see there's really only one parameter in here. It does show up twice. Uh, but that one parameter is mu, which is the mean of the distribution. Sometimes we also call that the rate of the distribution. Uh, everything else is observed. So here we've got y, y factorial, and the exponentiation operator. Here are some examples of what Poisson distributions can look like. Uh, in the panel up at the top, you'll see the uh, rate. So here we have a rate of 0 0.1, 1, 5, and 10. And you can see that the rate drastically changes the shape of the distribution. So with a rate of 0 0.1, we have something that's very heavily skewed toward the right. As we increase the rate to 1, it's still quite skewed. Once we get to 5, it's skewed still, but not nearly as bad. And once we get to 10, it looks pretty well normal. Right, single peaked and more or less symmetric. It's not exactly symmetric, but it's pretty close. So depending on the shape of, or the rate of the distribution, we get very different shapes. Uh, some of the properties of the distribution, we already talked about this, as mu increases, it moves the distribution to the right with less probability given to zero. Um, the variance of y is equal to mu. So this is a case uh, where the variance of the distribution and the mean of the distribution are the same. This is a property called equidispersion. 
Um, we'll talk about other models or a different model later today, which deals with over dispersion. Um, as mu increases, the probability that y equals zero decreases. Now, one of the features you'll find of a lot of data that we use in political science uh, that are counts is we tend to have lots of zeros. Um, and so it's possible, uh, it happens a lot, that we have more zeros than we would expect under the Poisson distribution. And as we saw earlier, as mu increases, the Poisson distribution becomes approximately normal. So we've got one parameter, and we need to figure out how to make our x variables change that parameter. Right, just like we did with the probability in the uh, binary GLM model, um, or just like we did with uh, using the linear predictor in the ordered logit and the multinomial logit model. So here, uh, we need to make sure that the way that we get the variables to change the value of mu fits with how mu works. So um, we know from how the Poisson distribution works that mu um, has to be uh, uh, positive. Right, so if mu has to be positive, it means that whatever transformation we apply to x beta has to generate a positive value. Right, so one good way of doing that is with the exponentiation operator. Um, so um, we know that if uh, x beta uh, is less than zero, then e to the x beta, uh, oh, sorry, I should write that a little different. Right, so if um, x beta is less than zero, e to the x beta is between zero and one. And if x beta greater than zero, uh, then 1, say equal, equal e to the x beta. If x beta is bigger than 0, e to the x beta will between, be between 1 and positive infinity. So if we take the logs on both sides, we see that the log of mu is just equal to x beta. Then when we plug those values in to the, um, so these values of mu into the Poisson uh, probability mass function, we get this, right? So this is the, this gives us the probability that y takes on uh, its observed value. So the likelihood function just like the likelihood functions that we've looked at over the past few lectures, um, works in pretty much the same way. Uh, what we're doing is we want to know, the likelihood function tells us the probability that y takes on its observed value. Uh, and unlike before, when we transform this by taking the log, it makes a somewhat more complicated looking expression. Uh, but that's okay, uh, because all of these are things that we can either know or can estimate, right? So we've got parameters here, and we've got data here, 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 and I suppose in a way here, and just being the number of observations. So those are all things that we can figure out. So it makes sense to move on to an example so we can uh, move away from talking abstractly about these kinds of models. So here we're reading in data from uh, the web. Uh, these are data from, uh, I th think, the General Social Survey. 
Uh, but the dependent variable here is the number of voluntary organizations that people joined. We're modeling this count as a function of age, education, unemployment, household income, left-right self-placement, number of kids, and the importance of religion. Because this is a GLM, so we're using exactly the same function that we used before, which is GLM, just with a different family. So here we're using the Poisson family instead of using the uh, binomial family that we used when we used binary dependent variables. So here you can see we get coefficients, standard errors, Z statistics, p-values, uh, just like we did before. So we can interpret these at least in terms of significance as telling us what statistically um, important for understanding the number of voluntary organizations and what's not. Also, just like before, um, the way that our x's relate to the mean is through some nonlinear function, which in this case is the log. And so it makes sense for us to um, use some of the tools that we've developed over the past few lectures to help understand the effects of those variables. The Poisson does give us one other way of interpreting things that we haven't really paid attention to uh, in the past. And this is by um, exponentiating the coefficient. So uh, if we imagine that we've got some x, uh, let's say age in the model that we just looked at, um, and that age is moving from one value to another. So let's say we wanted to move age from 25 to 45, right? So that would be, that would make delta in this case 20, right? Because we're increasing age by 20 years. If we wanted to know by what factor our count should change as we increase age by 20 years, we would exponentiate the coefficient for age times 20. And that would tell us by what factor it will increase. Thinking about doing this for education, so the coefficient for education is 0 0.17. And so the exponentiation of 0 0.17 times 1 equals 1.185. To put this in a little more uh, concrete fashion, what I've done is I've made a little fake data set. So here we have age as 45. Uh, education, which we're changing by one unit. We're going from 11 to 12, and we're going from 16 to 17. Otherwise, we're holding everything else constant. We're then generating predictions from the model. So this is education equals 11, 12, 16, and 17. And so you can see that the difference between these two, so between 11 and 12, is about 0 0.1, but the distance here is about 0 0.25. However, if we divide 0.68 by 0.58, we get about 1.185, and if we divide 1.61 by 1.36, we get about the same number. Right, so that tells us that as we move from one value to another, whatever the count, whatever our predicted count would have been, it will be multiplied by um, e to the b delta. So this is sort of interesting, but it's actually not maximally helpful because it doesn't actually tell us anything about the value of the predicted counts. Right, it doesn't actually tell us what we would expect for the dependent variable, only what we would expect the difference to look like. 
Because this is a, a GLM, we can use all the same functions that we've used to evaluate GLMs before. We can use GLM change, which says that it, as age goes from uh, moves by one standard deviation around its mean, we increase the number of organizations by about 0.14. A standard deviation in education gets us an increase of about 0.35. And the biggest one being unemployed, which um, as we go from not employed to employed, that increases the number of voluntary organizations. Um, by about 0.6. And that's the biggest effect that we see um, for a change in, uh, in this model. If you like the average marginal effect approach better, we can use the GLM change to function. And here you see for a standard deviation change in education, we get um, uh, an increase of about 0.35 moving from the biggest to smallest value on unemployment, which would be employed to non-employed, we get a change of about minus 0.7. So this is an even bigger effect than we saw before. Uh, and both of these are statistically different from zero. The effects package works as well. So we can plot out um, by education how much we expect or how many voluntary organizations we expect people to join. And we see that as education increases from its smallest to its largest, we go from somewhere near zero on the low end to somewhere near about one and a half on the high end. Right, and obviously people aren't gonna join one and a half organizations, right? We have a variable that's only counts, but that tells us about what the distribution would look like in repeated sampling for that kind of observation, right? So it would have a mean of 1.5. So just like before, when we saw what the Poisson distribution looked like, so here's the Poisson distribution for one. 1. 1.5 would, you know, be a little more like that maybe. Maybe probably not, it wouldn't be quite that different, but it would look more like that. Right, we'd be putting more probability out in these um, higher values and slightly less probability in zero. If you like the average marginal effect approach, you can see the av f plot works just as well. Um, and produces what looks like about the same kind of result. There's a POIS fit function, which gives you um, fit measures for the Poisson and what we'll talk about in a second, which is the negative binomial distribution or model. We get the usual set of R squared uh, or pseudo R squared values here. So just like before, there's a sort of considerable range but we get also two other tests. So these are goodness of fit tests for the Poisson distribution. Um, the null hypothesis here is that the assumption of equidispersion, that is the assumption that the mean and variance are the same, holds. And the alternative is that it doesn't. Here we see that our p-values are less than 0.05, which means that this assumption likely doesn't hold and that we need a different sort of modeling strategy. Uh, the strategy that we need is what we'll talk about next. So the negative binomial model is the one that's used when we have an overdispersed variable. Overdispersion is when the variance is greater than the mean. And overdispersion is the attribute of an outcome variable and a model. Data are not inherently over-dispersed. Although sometimes you will hear people talk about um, count data as though they are over-dispersed. But 
um, we have to evaluate dispersion uh, and whether it's equidispersion or overdispersion in a particular model. Uh, some models of the same variable might exhibit overdispersion, while others don't. And the sort of conventional wisdom is that it's possible to model away overdispersion, but usually only if the variance is two or three times bigger than the mean. If it's more than that, then it's unlikely that even with a good model, we would be able to model away that sort of thing. The negative binomial model adds an error term to the linear predictor that has expected value zero and is assumed to be uncorrelated with the remainder of the x variables. So this would be just like an error term in our linear model, right? It has mean zero and is uncorrelated with everything else in the model. The difference happens here when we put this in um, in this nonlinear function, the exponentiation operator, what we really get is e to the xb times e to the error. And we're going to call this e to the error, in this case, delta. Uh, now there's a, a reasonable amount of math on this slide. Um, but I want to just hit the high points here. Uh, the first is that we assume that the expected value of the error is zero. So we assume that the expected value of delta, which would be the expected value of e to the error, uh, is equal to one. So that's just a simple uh, sort of mathematical calculation. And because of that, since that expectation of delta is one, what we're saying is that on average, we don't actually change the rate in our distribution only the variance. Now, as it turns out, we, we don't actually know and can't really estimate delta, um, or we can't do it directly, then the probability generating function is a little bit more complicated. So here, uh, what's important to note is that now there are two parameters, right? The parameters are mu and alpha. Uh, we'll call alpha to the minus one, right? And they show up a lot. The rest is just data and functions, right? So this is a this is a function called gamma, and gamma is like factorials, but it doesn't. It's not just for integer data. It works for non-integer values too. Alpha here, it's not delta itself, but it's it tells us about the variance of delta. And what we know is that the variance of y is a function of mu and the variance of delta, right? And in fact, it's this function. It's mu plus alpha times mu squared. So we know mu is positive, And we also know since alpha is a variance that it's also positive. So this term, we know, has to be bigger than mu, right? So it has to be the case that the negative binomial variance is bigger than the Poisson variance. Here are some examples of negative binomial distributions. Um, in the columns, we have mu. Uh, and here we have uh, alpha. Well, if alpha, uh, yeah, here we have alpha. And so you can see um, this gives us something close to our Poisson distribution, right? Where we've got at one a really heavy skew at five, still skewed, but not as bad. And at 10, something that looks more or less symmetric is still actually less symmetric than in the Poisson distribution, but it looks, you know, sort of single peaked and maybe not perfectly symmetric, but close. As we increase that variance, what you can see is we're sending more and more probability toward zero. 
right? So even with the same mean, right, even with a mean of 10, we're taking a lot of the probability that's in here and sending it back towards zero, right? So the zeros here have a lot higher probability than they did up here. Uh, the same thing happens in the um, distribution when mu is five. Uh, and when mu is one, we get a distribution that looks pretty much the same. You can see this happen uh, really starkly when alpha is five. So here, almost regardless of the mean, we get really high probability of being zero, right? A really low probability of being pretty much anything else. So this can really change the nature of what the distribution looks like um, as we change the value of alpha. So the glm.nb function is in the mass package. And this is still a GLM, but it's one that uses the negative binomial family and estimates um, alpha. You can see the over dispersion parameter is actually right here. 1.56 about is our over dispersion parameter. So that tells us the variance of uh, alpha. Or sorry, the variance of delta. Um, and I have a, a few slides coming up that will help compare these two models. So here, what I've done is just look at the Poisson distribution. So this is not the, not the results of the model, but just looking at the Poisson distribution um, and what our observed values are, right? So this is the, in our dependent variable, the observed probabilities of zero, the observed probability of one, and so forth. And the orange bars are the Poisson distribution um, predictions of zero, one, and so forth, um, given the mean of our variable. In the negative binomial panel over here, we have the same thing, but we've got the probabilities of y um, for observed and predicted uh, based not just on the mean of y, but also on the over dispersion parameter that we estimated in the model above. So here we don't have any independent variables, but we are changing the dispersion. And you can see here that these are much closer together than they were in the Poisson example. Right, so we think that this is probably, in general, a better fit for the data that we have. If we look at the predictions from the two models, right, so these are now our model predictions, we can see that they're very, very closely related. And here the correlation between the two is like 0.99 something. Um, so they're really, really closely related. So even though we have these two different models, um, the predictions that we get from the models don't change all that much. Um, this tells you about the coefficient. So here we have, um, for each of these, the Poisson coefficient divided by the negative binomial coefficient. Um, the vertical dotted line is at one. So if they were one, it would mean the two coefficients were exactly the same. Um, and you can see the bounds of this graph are pretty closely, um, are pretty close to one, right? So um, the biggest difference that we get is the age coefficient is about 10% bigger in the Poisson model than it is in the negative binomial model. And the left right coefficient here is not quite 10% um, smaller than it was um, uh, in the Poisson model relative to the negative binomial model. So we're seeing differences that are generally pretty small uh, in the coefficients.
But if we look at a likelihood ratio test of the two different or the two different models, um, this would be a test of the null hypothesis that alpha equals zero uh, versus the alternative that alpha greater than zero. Uh, what we see here is that the p-value is less than 0.05. And so we would conclude that even though the coefficients don't change much and the predictions don't change much, that this is a better model. So because these are still GLMs, everything that we've done with GLMs still works. So the stuff from the DAMIS package, the CAR package, and the effects package all still work just as well on these models as they did on other GLMs. And even though we haven't spent a lot of time sort of belaboring this point, the stuff that you would present if you do these models is basically the same as the stuff you would present when you do any model, right? You wanna give people the model coefficients you want to give them a sense of what the effects look like, especially if the models are nonlinear, like the GLMs that we've been talking about. And you want to do that in ways that make it easy for people to understand the real impact of those variables. And so by that, I mean either first differences or, or graphs, probably. And you also want to give people a sense of how the model fits. Right, so is it, a, is it a good fitting model or a bad fitting model? And so all of those pieces are pieces that we would use in any model um, to try to get people to understand what we did. So the next lecture that we'll talk about um, is uh, sort of spatially or uh, aggregated um, or dependent data. Um, and then the last one will be multiple imputation and you should see those coming shortly.